check it out. The world won't understand you. Hey, but it's okay. Say the world won't understand you. Cause I made you in my own way. Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 113 of In a Good Way podcast. Today's special guest is Ana Cecilia Gonzalez. She's joining us from Houston, Texas. She's had multiple NDEs, near-death experiences, and multiple STEs, spiritually transformative experiences. She's been seeing angels since childhood. She has been visited many times by what she called the ghost of death. She is an author of the book, When Life is Not Forever. Um, Ana Cecilia was born with a congen congenital heart condition which had a very bad prognosis and by some miracle she survived um she's been having experiences after a complication in 1989 i believe is when you had your big nde yes okay so in 1989 yeah. after that she began having a lot of out-of-body experiences communication with beings from the other side and so on and so forth uh it's an honor to have you here ana cecilia thank you so much for being here Thank you. Thank you, Omar. Thank you. Thank you for having me here and for inviting me to share what I believe it's one of the biggest gifts in my life. No. First of all, which is life. Mm. Just being alive, just the fact of being alive is definitely a beautiful gift. So yeah. yes, just as you were saying, I was born with a very, very serious heart condition, congenital heart condition. And at that time, we're talking, and I, I don't care about telling my age because it's just a miracle that I'm alive. I was born in 1964 where nothing was really uh, developed for somebody that was born with my condition. Oh. Usually children died at about four, eight years old, and that was the most they could make it. Because there's a, there's a, just for people that might be listening that could understand, it's a transposition of great vessels with one single ventricle and pulmonary stenosis. That means that all the time the blood was mixed. Mm. Blue blood and red blood was mixed. So I had a lack of oxygen. So the way you could develop was was very uh, shorted of, uh, I, I had a lot of shorted of breath and I was I was very tired all the time. So usually, so my parents knew about this since I was a little girl because I was purple. So because of the lack of air. So it was a very difficult moment for my parents, but when they finally understood that the prognosis, uh, they told them, you know, I don't think she's going to make it more than probably seven, eight years. There's, it's, there's no way because what I, my condition, that's what they told my parents, is not compatible with life. Wow. Imagine. So just imagine, Dylan, let me take you to that woman. Just imagine a parent. They already had my older sister having a little baby in their arms and just saying, okay, enjoy her as much as you can. Because there's there's no there's no option there's no way of survival. Wow. So yes, it, it was a difficult childhood. I was all of my my nails uh, started turning like they they call them like uh, uh, drum drumsticks because they 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 turn like a little ball. All of, all of the nails starts turning purple and they change because of the lack of oxygen. Wow. So my parents had a very difficult journey. And I was all constantly at the hospital, constantly sick. Any single um, fever or anything I had always got complicated. So they started taking me to Mexico City. And I recall probably one of the first moments that I remember that I can have, that I think I had a uh, spiritually transformative experience. I was It was when I was four. And I remember that very well because I was taken to a special hospital in Mexico, <clears throat> Mexico City. I was born in Monterey, but there was nothing in Monterey. And, uh, and they brought me to Houston at the age of, uh, well, I was a little older. I was about nine months old. And they told my parents the same thing they told in Mexico. So there was no option. There was re really nothing for me just to wait for maybe someday they would develop something, but it was like very far away. Mm. So when I was four, I, they were just taking care of me as, as well as they could. And I was four and then uh, I was in a IC, ICU 
and because I had a fever and I had a complication of uh, some a flu. So they were my parents were only allowed to be there in the room one hour in the morning and one hour in the afternoon. So just imagine a four-year-old without the parents all day long, because back then they didn't allow parents to be with the child as much as they do now. Wow. <clears throat> Those things have changed in a beautiful way because what a child needs is mom and dad. They need family. Hmm. But back then it was so, so sad. That's probably one of the saddest days I remember from me being a little girl. Wow. And I was left in my crib in a very deep crib so you wouldn't go out and run because a four-year-old can run everywhere. So I was put in a little crib. And I remember my godmother came coming with me and giving me a little doll. It was a very modern doll back then that you just pulled the cord and it cried. Remember? So those back then, we're talking about uh, 19, 1970 or something like that. It was like very modern <laughs> And but that doll meant a lot to me because it cried all the the I, I what I wanted is to cry and let the world know I was I was sad. Mm. So she was my company. And uh, and I'm, I tell you this because that night, well, when she they, they left and of course I cried. And I remember telling my mother, you're horrible. You're a bad mother. Don't leave because I didn't want to be alone. Mm. So my mom remembers that. And and I, that's part of what I wrote in my book when she, she turns to my dad and says, I know she, she hates me, but how can I explain to her that she's so sick and that I have to leave her, that I love her? But it was so difficult for a four-year-old to understand all that. So I was just very upset. But my doll there kept me company. So that day, one night, uh, one of the doctors came just to try to keep company and play with me. So he started playing with my doll. Because when I was so upset and I got so tired of crying because I had lack of air, I started making her cry. The thing is that somebody had to cry. Oh. Someone had to cry. Mm -hmm. If it was not me because I was tired, I made her cry. So everybody was like, okay, the doll's crying and crying. So this doctor came and he, he started playing with my doll. And suddenly, what, what do you think happened? He broke it. He was wow. playing with it. So it was like, Wow, no, you broke my doll. Just imagine a four-year-old shouting at the doctor. You're you're the worst person in the world. Oh give my god. Doll. So I he said, No, 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 I'll try to fix it. Please give her to me. No, don't take her away because that was the only thing I had to hold on when I was in that crib by myself all night. So I remember him taking, he tried to give me a popsicle and a candy and I just threw them back to him. I don't want anything. So they left with the doll trying to fix it. That night, Omar, I remember being one of the loneliest nights. And I do remember opening my eyes and feeling an, a light on top of me, like a being. And I didn't understand, but back then, later in the years, he kept on appearing. And I, once I understood that I was in a very serious condition, I called him the ghost of death. I thought it was a ghost mm. that was coming and get me. So I just saw this light on top of me. And for a moment, I felt relieved. But I was crying so, so lonely. And then the morning when my mom came to me, and she was like, oh, the doctor came back early. And he said, sorry, I couldn't fix it. It was not, not easy to fix. So I gave, he gave me the doll and I just held on to it until my mother came at about 10 in the morning. And she said, you know, uh, what did you do? You, do you, you ruined this doll. No, mom, it was not me. It was the doctor. Come on, doctors don't do that. She didn't believe me. Wow. But you know, Mar, that was my first lesson. Who cares if she doesn't believe me? Mm -hmm. I wanted to be with my mom. So, okay, I mean, that that's a, that's something that I could have stick to that pain of her believing that I broke it. And of course, it, it, I could have made a big deal out of it. Mm -hmm. And it was, okay, who cares? I have my doll and I have my mom. So mm -hmm. she took me out of the crib and we started walking. And so that was the first time that I felt that I was, You sometimes you need to let things go so you can advance and, and, and move on. I needed to stop, okay, I, I don't like being here. And I was four. I don't like people to take my little doll, but how many of us have 
have those attachment to things that when when they go, you feel they have nothing. Mm-hmm. So I didn't care that my mom didn't believe me about that beautiful doll that was my my greatest present, and that she didn't believe me that that didn't break it. What mattered was that I I was able to move on and I had my mom back and I was finally out of the hospital. But that was one of the, probably one of the loneliest nights I remember. And there's the first night that I thought I I felt company out of, there was nobody but this light on top of me. So as the years passed, miraculously I was surviving. Nobody understood how. But then some a, a little, every time I was very sick, these beings started appearing. Mm-hmm. And I could, I nowadays they say, well, they're they're imaginary friends. You could mm-hmm. talk about anything, but this one came and and sat in front of me, and 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 I I knew I was sick, and I remember telling him, go away, I don't want you to be here because I thought he was gonna come and take me. So when and when I was probably about eight, I was so tired of going to the hospital that I once just told my told told my dad, you know. And my mom, they were taking me because I was I was in a moment in which I tell this to doctors. Now things have changed, but I asked questions and they didn't give me answers. Mm. You know, they just took me to the hospital, took my blouse out, and they started sticking things to do an electrocardiogram. But I said, "Why do you have to do this? Why to me?" So I thought I was being a bad child. You know, I was. So I thought I was misbehaving, and I needed to to change something. And I said, well, just tell me what I have to do better, but I don't want to be here. Why why me and not my siblings? So I was a rebellious young woman, thank God, because that made me be who I am now. So I told my parents, you know, I'm not coming anymore. That's it. I'm not coming. Why don't you bring my siblings? Why just me? And then it's when my dad spoke to me and he said, you know, you have something in your heart and we need to take care of you. It's something very serious, and you need to listen to the doctor. You need to listen to your mom. But we, whenever we tell you you need to come to the doctor, you need to come. In that moment, Amari, in that moment, I understood that I was going to die. Sometimes parents tell more with what they don't say than with what they say. Mm-hmm. But they didn't need to tell me, you're so ill that you might die at any moment. They didn't need, they didn't need to say that. I understood it. My spirit understood it. So parents, don't, like I say, don't try to offend your child's intelligence. They know a lot. They understand much more. And when a child is asking a question, he knows, but he's just wanting to make clear, to make sense. So I said, okay, now I understand why I come to the hospital so often. Now I understand. So at that age, I only had two options. I said, either... I I go into the grieving because I'm so sick and I'm I'm always in the hospital or try to get the best out of life. Mm-hmm. I only had two options. And I took the second one. I said, okay, I'm gonna if I'm gonna live, if I'm not gonna live forever, there's where the name of my book comes from. What do you do when life is not forever? Mm-hmm. So I at that age I said, okay, life is not gonna be forever as I thought. So I better start enjoying it. But I do remember that Raphael, I I named my, now I know it was an angel because he kept coming and coming every time I was sick. And I started arguing, why do you have to come? You're going to take me with you. And then I said, okay, who are you? So I decided to put a name. So I said, okay, I don't know if you are Rafael or Rafaela, because I thought like Rafael sounds like nice. So I'm going to name you Raphael. Because mm. Rafael is not <laughs> feminine or masculine, so Rafael. So you know, many years later, Omar, when I was writing my book, and it was only then, and I promised this, I said, "Well, what does Rafael mean? Let's find a meaning. Maybe it has a meaning." And then I found out that this is the name of the Archangel Rafael, but in Catalan, oh. in Spanish, in Catalan. I didn't know that was the name way they mentioned it. And then the the, the most interesting thing is that this name is given to this archangel that is called the Archangel of Health. So like, wow. And all of this I discovered when I was writing my book. But I named him like that through my childhood. 
So here you are, Raffle again. So I started to get used to this being of light appearing to me constantly. So that I had very different moments during my childhood. Or for me, living a spiritual journey was like the most normal thing. Mm. Having, of course, these are things that you cannot share with anybody when you're a child, because who will understand that I see this being always and he always comes when I'm sick. Or this other one, when I was a little girl, I was probably six or seven. And I, my grandfather had a swimming pool at his ranch. So we used to go there, but it was not, it didn't have this heating. It was not heated. You know, it was just like the sun was there and whatever, but there's usually the water was cold, but I loved to swim. Mm. So I went in the water, but whenever I, I wanted to come out, it took me 10 times more to warm up my body than any other person. Mm. So, but I was never a whiner, is that the word? Crying, and I was never gonna be complaining. Wow. So I never told anybody that I, I was freezing. So I was really getting into a hy hypothermia constantly. I mean, I, this happened very often. So I remember that one day, especially that I came out of the pool, my parents were far away just gathering with all the family. And I was so cold, I just covered myself with a towel and laid down in the floor to try to warm up a little bit with the floor beside the, the pool. And in that moment, I think I was just uh, uh, really dying because I remember coming out of my body and just looking at everybody like if I was flying. And I remember having the view of everybody around the ranch. I saw the ranch from very far away and I saw my body laying in the floor and I had this, it was like if I was able to fly around all the place and I didn't understand what was going on. Of course, Raffle was around there. And then suddenly I see my dad running and then hugging me because I was about five or six, hugging me and holding me tight. And in that moment, I came back to my body. Wow. So I do, I have, several moments of this where I was out of my body having a view and, a, and an experience and then I my dad running to get me back and he knew I was freezing so he starts rubbing me and getting me heated warm so I never told them these stories I never told anybody these stories until I wrote my book I started really understanding that this had a name that these were called spiritually transformative experiences that that they were experiences out of the body. And then many of us have them, but many of us just don't know how to say them. They when 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 you're not in this in this uh group of people or you're you're not surrounded by all of these terms, terminology, and you're just like, well, I was raised a Catholic, and those things were like, no, those things could be of the devil and don't. So you don't want to, you don't even want to risk it mm. to start talking about what was going on in my life. But I was constantly having this, this, this out of body experiences. And I believe that it was moments in which my body was just living. I was just uh, in a very close moment to death. But then of course, my, my now, and I understand it was my angel, Rafa was constantly there because there was a purpose for my life. Mm. So without understanding life, I just took life and decided to live it to the fullest. But one of the greatest gifts my parents gave me, and this is something for everybody to take note of, they, in spite of whatever circumstances, because of course I was, I was born with a, with a, like a, a stamp in my heart, in my brain, in my, that I was going to die soon. But my dad, that day that I was telling you that we, he was telling me about the diagnosis, he said something that make a shift in my life. He said, okay, this is a prognosis. This is diagnosis. But what if God has another plan? Mm -hmm. And that but, what if, made the whole difference in my life. So in my mind, in my head was, but what if I see that I am sick? I see that there's no resources but what if there's a possibility? So the visualization in my life, my parents never stopped me 
from dreaming. Mm -hmm. So even though they knew maybe I was never going to be a grown-up, they always let me dream that I, one day I was going to have a boyfriend because my nails and my lips, I was constantly purple. Mm -hmm. So I said, who was going to fall in love with somebody that's purple all the time? I even, when I was seven, I thought I was born, I was a Godzilla daughter. You know, maybe you're too young for that, but in my time, Godzilla were like the cartoons. It was this dinosaur that was all black and purple because when I was so tired, I became very purple, very dark because sometimes I just walked a block and I was so, I was gasping, I was out of air. So I said, I think my parents are lying and I'm not their daughter. I'm, <laughs> I'm the daughter of a, well, at seven, I really believed it. I said, there's something odd here. So that day, I would, after that with my dad, I, they never stopped me from visualizing that one day I was going to grow, grow up. I was going to have a boyfriend. Maybe one day I was going to get married. I was going to study. I was going to have a college degree. I was going to work. I was going to have a family. And all of these dreams were there. So the visualization was never stopped. They, nobody ever came, at least not my parents, came to say, don't do this because these are going to be the consequences. Because that kills a dream, you know, mm -hmm. don't do that because so sometimes my parents did, did say, stop running because you're going to become purple. I mean, you're going to, that was like dark. But then I always had these beautiful beings in my life, which one of them was my, my grandmother, which came to me and in secret, she said, okay, what do you want to do? Well, I want to run and get there like my, all of my nephews and all of my cousins. And then she said, why don't you go start running? And when you're tired, you stop. Mm. You, you breathe and then you continue, but just do it. So she was like a cheerleader. One thing that I learned by, in my life, Omar, is that all of us, each one of us are born, come to this world with exactly the tools we need to survive and to make the best out of our lives. Using them or not is our decision. You have options. You will always have options. So I had my parents. I had my grandparents that were like, okay, my mother was trying to limit me because she didn't want me to gasp and faint and all those things that could happen. But then I had my grandmother telling me, just go do it. And then if you get tired, well, just stop. So that was one of the biggest things that they gave me, the control of my own stopping myself when I was physically very tired. Mm. And I'm telling you this because sometimes we don't even notice when I, with our children, but we amputate their abilities with our thoughts. So we think if she does that, this is what's going to happen. Wait, let her discover it. Give her a little freedom. Let her stop herself. Let her be in, because one day she's going to be by herself and she's going to have no parents around or nobody to tell her what to do. So that was one of the biggest gifts God gave me through my parents. They never, they, they never stopped me from, from visualizing. So I survived much more than when anybody imagined. When I was about 15, I don't know how I got to that age without any surgeries, with, because there was really no surgeries by no. me with medicines. There was, there was nothing. A surgery was starting to develop when I was about 13 or 14. So I had an endocarditis for the first time in my life. I had a real problem that stopped me. It was a, it was a, um, a uh, heart infection. So it came into my heart and there was no way in Mexico they could solve it. So they took me, they brought me to Houston and they, in the hospital, they said, well, she, she needs to stay. We need to bring her in because this is a serious, uh, and, and it is in her heart and her heart is really in a very bad condition. Mm -hmm. So. I was there in that moment, I finally, because I thought I was never going to be able to have a boyfriend, you know, but you know, I had several, <laughs> I had several, thank God. But so my boyfriend <clears throat> came to visit me. I was almost 15 and he was 17. We were teenagers, but, but it was important for me to be able to know that I was, I was a normal kid that could have a, a boyfriend. Thank God that was not a problem, but he came to visit me. And doctors saw that I had somebody there. So they said, you know, we need to talk to you because you're a grown up now. 
And it's very different, very different, the culture in Mexico than the way I was raised from the culture maybe in, in any other country. But they say, we need to talk to you because you're an adult. That was the first time in my life I was with a doctor without my parents. Mm -hmm. They always were there with me, always taking care of me. So they said, we need to talk to your daughter about something. So they came to me, Omar, that day and they said, you know, we see you have a boyfriend. And we see you're hanging around with him. That's very good. But, you know, it's really a miracle to see that you're still alive because of this condition. So they asked me, have you started with uh, sexual relations with him? And I said, oh, no, but come yeah. on, I'm not married. No, not yet. And I said, OK, OK. We're talking to a Latin Mexican woman. She's not married. She's, she's not in there yet. OK, yeah. don't start. Don't even start thinking about it because you won't be able to hold them. Forget about getting pregnant. I mean, you mm. can't do pregnancy. Forget about getting married. No, don't think about getting married, please, because you're not going to be able to hold on to this. Your heart is. And I was like, wait, 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 wait a minute. You're telling me that was like a death sentence. Mm. Tell me, no, 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 no. But everything in my mind, all the visualization I have, all the dreams I have about studying, about getting married, about having a family, about working. What am I going to do with all that? They're here. Mm. So I remember telling her, because he was a female doctor. I said, she said, do you have any questions? And I said, mm, just one favor. Uh, all of this, I want to tell this to my parents, not you. Oh, no, no, no. This is private. You're an adult now. I mean, you're grown up. And this is information only for you. We're not asking any of this to your parents. This is private. Okay, because that's the only thing. I want to be able to tell that to my parents. And that was important, Omar, because the title of my book for that chapter is called I Lied. Oh. Because when my mom came, of course, she was my dearest mom. She was just, she, they've always taken such good care of me. They were also afraid. They didn't know. I mean, I didn't know that back then. I was probably one of one of the oldest alive. Most of them had died already. Everybody had, with my condition, everybody was dead. Mm. So uh, I, I I met a lot of people with my condition in that. I was there for two weeks. And I got, you know, we didn't have a phone. We didn't have all this. So I took their mailing address and I sent letters written by hand and and I found out that many of them died by the time I sent my letter, got there. Wow. It was it was a very sad moment. But I do remember that when my mom came to me and said, okay, what did the doctor say? Did you ask them about, about growing up and getting married? And I said, yes, mom. They said, it's okay that I could continue with my life and my heart will stop me whenever I stop. But I could continue with my life. So I lied. <laughs> Because if I would have told that to my mom, do you know what would have happened? She would have sent me to a convent with a with a nuns and just stay there, just protect me. But and and I want to stop here for a moment because sometimes our decisions, even lying, it's a survival mode. Mm. For me, it was a moment I don't feel bad about this. It was something I needed because if I believed that in my head, what happened in my body would have been devastating. Mm. So I needed to believe that my body was going to resist. And nowadays, we have a lot of doctors. We have the Dr. Joe Dispenza, Maria Alonso Puch. There's, there's a, Evan Alexander. There's a lot of doctors that talk about what happens to the body with your thoughts mm. and how the body regenerates the body the, uh, particularly the cell the cells in your body reorganize with they the information you give them through your thoughts something happened that my body found a balance a balance that nobody nowadays understand and let me tell you that i know this for a fact with my condition exactly the way i have it i'm probably the oldest alive with my condition nowadays everybody passed Wow. Because there's there's no way the body could resist. Some of them survived maybe longer. But uh, when I wrote my book, I remember I had this doctor, a uh, Dr. Roma. She, she helped me investigate this. 
And she says, nobody known in the United States, Europe, now is alive with your condition. There's been, and nevertheless, with what I'm going to tell you next, because of course I survived, mm. as you can see. <laughs> and I did have a boyfriend, and then I did get married, and and I got pregnant. Oh. Well, that was a very risky thing because definitely, uh, like, like doctors say, like, how did you dare have a baby? Well, I just asked God and he gave her to me. But I, I it was not that I was irresponsible. I was really, we were taking care, but it was not our, my the methods of taking care of pregnancy was not easy for me because of my condition. And if I took pills, it was bad for my blood stream. Oh. So it, it was not easy. But the thing is that I, thank God I, I survived. I got married. My parents did talk to my back then husband and they said, you know, she's sick and we don't know how long she's going to live. I mean, they needed to be honest to the family. And, mm -hmm. and I was honest. The moment I met any boyfriend I had, I told them right away, mm -hmm. this is my condition. This is who I am. I never, ever lied to anybody. But that, that moment to my mom telling her, uh, yeah, they said that I could continue. And I, and I believed that I had the tools I needed to stop whenever I, whenever I needed to stop. It, you know, Omar, there, there's a wisdom inside us that we need to develop and we need to let our children develop. Mm. Sometimes we think they're making the wrong decisions, but sometimes they need to make them to learn. You telling them what to do works up to a certain point but there's a moment in which you need for them to prove things up to a contained way you know but but you need to to let them fly you need to let them know and learn so what i learned is that i knew my my limits but of course there's you're not like uh, uh because i don't consider myself like a supernatural being i just think that i i did hear that i had a purpose that I was always, Raffle was always, always walking with me. There was no way I, I could ever say that I was by myself, but I acknowledge that. But yes, it was something that I couldn't tell my mom. And yeah, hey, there's this angel walking with me all the time. It was not something I could talk about, but that made me feel secure, made me feel confident. So yeah, I did got married and then I got pregnant. It was a very, very complicated pregnancy. Nobody thought I was going to survive, of course. Mm. We, I, I, in my mind, it was, you know, God, I, I want a child, but if this is not going to be possible, I just won't get pregnant. How many women are there that just can't get pregnant? Mm. So, yes, I was. And this is something to talk about, because I think that when I got pregnant, I had I had a, uh, ovulated two times in that period because I, I was it was I was not really thinking that in that moment I was going to get pregnant. So when I went to the doctor, he said, you know, we need to make these testings because I think there's something going on. Oh, well, yes, I was pregnant. It was a very, very difficult pregnant. She was, my daughter was born four pounds. She was a little bitty, but eight and a half months. So she almost made it. She was perfectly healthy, but just a little, tiny little, but that wow. was exactly <laughs> what my body could hold. Wow. So I think that God granted this baby to me because she was going to be one of my greatest motivations to keep on going. Mm. So I go back to what I told you at the beginning. We all have the anything that presents to us in our in life. It could be you could use it as a negative thing or as an opportunity. It's your decision, whatever, because uh, the tools are going to be there. It's in your favor or against you. It's like somebody says, the only thing I see in front of me are stones. Well, make a bridge out of them or make build, build a house. Do something with those stones, but don't look at them as an obstacle. Because the moment you see anything that's happening with you, to you, as, a, as only an obstacle and not as an opportunity to build something different, then your life stops there and you're you're going to be getting like the two options I told you, just whining and crying about the miserable I am or looking at, well, let me take the best out of this thing. So I think I always, I've always chosen the second option 
but it has not been like I was born with this wisdom. This is something I developed, but I started learning how to listen to my heart and my soul since I was a very young, at a very young age. So <clears throat> when my daughter was about eight or nine months old, I was, I was really having a very, there was just remember, there was still no surgery, nothing. I, I had, I had survived my, my condition. I was probably one of the oldest alive. I had a little daughter. So just imagine what the heart has to go on during a pregnancy. Mm. So my heart was really, really tired. So by the time she was nine months old, I couldn't really take care of her. She was running up and down and coming and, mm. and I was too tired for that. She wanted to go up the stairs. Every time I, I, I just imagine trying to go the steps up. By the time I was, I was in the third or fourth, fourth um, level, I, I needed to rest. I didn't have air. Mm. And my mother started watching that. And every time I talked on the phone, I was gasping constantly. So there was something really going on. I went to, the, to the, my cardiologist. <clears throat> And he said, you know, I think the time has come where you do need a surgery. I mean, we need to do something because your heart is extremely tired. So again, I came to Houston because there was nothing in moderate yet for those kind of things. So, but I remember going back when I was 15, they told me, maybe in 10 years, we will have something for you. Just imagine, nowadays we say, well, maybe in two months, you'll have an answer because everything's advancing so fast. Mm. AI, everything is just like, everything changes. Well, back then it was maybe in 10 years, we'll have a surgery for you. So just keep yourself alive. The only thing you have to do is make sure you're alive before, so we have an option for you. So it, it had passed nine years by the time I went back with a daughter and everything. And I remember that when the doctor received me in Houston, they, one of them did ask me, Dr. Nagel said, wait a minute, but do you have a C-section here? How did you dare have a baby? And I said, well, doctor, I asked God and I think he gave her to me. She said, how is she? She's perfectly healthy. I took pictures. I showed him pictures. I showed him. And he said, he just smiled like saying, oh God, I can't believe this. So there's where I understood for the first time that everybody with my condition that I had met had gone. Mm. But, you know, before getting to that, to that point where what where was really my near-death experience, my the most amazing experience, I remember that when I was probably 18, there's where I said, what am I going to study as a college degree? I, I decided to study, to study law. Oh. By law, because I needed to understand justice. You know, I need why why was I alive? And all the children that I had met had died. So is is really God fair? Is is there's really a God that that I mean what what is about justice? What is it about why am I alive and why is everybody else dead? I needed to justify my life. So in that process, I was trying to understand God really, because I said, well, God must be an invention of of mankind to justify what what doesn't have any justification mm. so i we make him up you know it's <laughs> like that's what we do whenever you don't understand things so that the, so trying but, but i was i was raised in a family of faith and i knew that i had had experiences and i knew that i had saw being all my life so i knew there was something but why does god permit that some of us are alive and some of us are dead. Mm -hmm. So during my studies, I studied St. Augustine. I studied a lot of a lot of uh, philosophers, and and there was peace in my heart when I understood that just coming to life was a risk itself. So anybody that was here, you're already at a risk. But there was always this free will that we were always told that you have a free will to decide where or not to go. And, and then I came to peace understanding that it was not that God was unfair. It was, and I, it, it was something that just came to me like that. Like, you know, there must have been an agreement 
before we came here. Because everything is about contracts, about agreements, about you sign up things. And, the, and I said, okay, there must have been an agreement before I came that I signed that, okay, you're going to come with this condition and these are going to be your situations and you make the most out of it or you die and whine about it. And, and because I said, why are they people dying in the other side of the world? They don't have resources because at least I had the possibility to come to Houston to, to have a medical care. There was people that didn't have them, they died. So even that was had to be part of a, of a plan because otherwise God would be very unfair. So I said, so it's not that he's unfair, it's just that it's something that we make agreement and the way you accomplish that agreement is it's your decision. Mm -hmm. And that way is when I understood that it, it was also about giving us options to make the best out of this life. And people that were that came to this world with a lot of poverty, with a lot of physical limitations, with whatever part of the world you're born with, were born in, it had to be part of you and God's plan. Otherwise, this life would be completely unfair. And I do believe in, in fairness, in justice. So that's that's the reason I studied law. But I came to peace after that. And then, well, I'm going going back to, to my, when I get to the hospital, the doctor says, you know, I was by then, I was 24 years old. Mm -hmm. He said, I don't know how you have survived up, up to here. Mm -hmm. And if I could have told them, well, you know, I've been with angels and, and people around <laughs> me all the time. I was, I was not about to say that. But, but uh, I understood that there was a purpose very clearly. And I said, well, you know, I, I think I'm here because God wants me to be here. And, and I thank him. And I feel very, very blessed. Very blessed, I felt by then. There was no, there was, I've never had this thought of why me? No, never, never. It was just, what is it about this? What is it? What is it that I have to do? What is the purpose of this? Mm. Not like being a victim. I've never in my life considered myself a victim. All the way around, all the all the all the other side. It's been more like like I have I have a purpose with all of this. That's why it's happening. So when the doctor said you need a surgery, this is urgent. I mean, your heart is really failing. And they saw I had a daughter. They but for them it was very difficult because it was not only trying to save a, a woman, but also the mother of a child. You know, it's it's it gets more complicated. They had done this surgery. They had just started one year ago, but only children because there was not adults. I was the first adult that they were going to try to do a surgery on. And they, they didn't even know they, there was not real method because getting a surgery in an adult, it's so different from a little child. Mm. In a little child, everything is uh, tender and soft and and with an adult, you know, it's it, all the body tissue, everything is very different. So, they, but they were not going to stop because of that. So they tried, but so I remember they 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 uh, they did tell me how complicated it was. It was surgery that lasted eleven hours. It was a very very long surgery. I came out of the surgery very very complicated. It was um, I had a lot of uh, complications after that. They, I had a, a lack of, my oxygenation improved, but it was not really stable. So at the end, I was probably about two months in the hospital. Oh. But the interesting thing here was when they thought I was getting better, things would seem to get a little better. Of course, I was always missing my daughter. I had a picture of my daughter in front of my, in front of my bed all mm -hmm. the time. They took, every time they moved me, they took the picture out and then put it back in the other bed because she was my motivation. I, and you know, it's difficult because back then there was no cell phones where you could see mm. her. You can even not, not even talk to her or, or try to hear her sound because everything was on the phone and on these telephone lines that you need to take the cord all the way to the room. <laughs> so it was, it was not easy as, as now to have any information about my daughter. Just imagine leaving your daughter when she's nine months old 
and you're a 24 year old woman it was probably one of the most difficult things I've ever done but I do remember that when when I was getting a little better they took me to the room and something happened then 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 suddenly all of my something was developing an infection a big infection was developing around my lungs and around my heart I was getting full of fluids mm. all all fluids uh, were surrounding me so I started to stop being able to breathe so imagine speaking like that it was I, I didn't have any way to 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 communicate mm. so and immediately doctors uh, understood and I was already in a in the floor level, they understood that something was going on and the water had been fast. So they brought a electrocardi I mean, an electrocardiogram and then a, they did an echocardiogram. Everything that showed them and then an x-ray showed them that I was full of liquid all around the heart. So they immediately took me down to intensive care. And once I was there and they, this was serious, I told my parents, my husband, everybody, you know, we need to keep her here. And then next day in the morning, they tried to take out all this fluid to find out what was it. So it turned out to be a very, very staphylococo. I'm not sure the name in in the, in English. Well, it's a staph. Uh, well, somebody will find out there. But it's a <laughs> it's a very serious because I got it during the first surgery. It started developing, so it was full of it. So they started. To drain it out uh, through a little method of uh, putting it through the, uh, a little needle under my sternum and um, through my I mean, in the middle of my ribs. So when they were doing it, I'm telling you all of these details because it's important how things that we think are terrible accidents, sometimes they're the biggest blessings. Mm. So not everything, every single thing that happens in our life has a purpose, but it's your decision if you look at it as an opportunity or as a poor thing and just the negative. So what they did when they were doing this, they pinched my heart and I started to bleed. So it was low and it was really, Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> and it was an emergency. So immediately everybody was like, uh, they start calling for, I don't know the name of that, but it, it's an emergency and it was, a very, very rainy day. Oh, you know, wow. it was the thing is that it was, and it, the fact that it was a rainy day meant that doctors had not left. Oh. So all the doctors were still there because I needed another surgery and an urgent surgery. My heart was bleeding. And uh, so they immediately called my husband and called my, my parents, sign all these papers. We need to get her to surgery again. And I was like, wait a minute, I mean, another surgery. So in that moment, it probably took two or three minutes. Once again, after many years, I saw Raffo again. So he appeared while I was walking all the way to the, to the surgery room. And I saw him there and I said like, wow, long time no see. So you're still here. And I could perfectly communicate with him through my mind. And I was praying, I started to pray and I said, you know, God, I understand, this is it. This is a moment, let me tell you, that I, I'm very grateful for my life. Mm. I started having this beautiful prayer saying, thank you for everything you gave me. You even gave me the opportunity to bring a child to this world. Thank you for this gift. Thank you for everything. Please take care of my husband, take care of my, of my parents, but most of all, take care of my daughter. And then I started talking to Raffle and I said, Raffle, is there a way you can intervene and just tell God that if he gives me a chance? And this was like trying to negotiate with him <laughs> that I will return to him a beautiful daughter. Tell him I will raise an amazing daughter. Give me the chance to be with my daughter again. Give me the chance to, to see her again. I promise I will raise a beautiful... If there is a chance, please talk to God and tell God. And then I talk to God myself and God, please. I know I've been rebellious and I know at some point I've been like, are you really there? But it was just a matter of understanding my own life in this world. 
So I, and I, I remember, I said, forgive me if I did anything wrong, but I really want to ask you for another chance. Give me the chance to be here for my daughter. So I remember all that, but it seemed to me like it was such a long talk, but it was only minutes. But that conversation with Rafa was so important because I do remember asking, give me another chance to see my daughter. Mm. Well, and this is important because of what happened next. So I went into the room immediately, you know, it's an emergency. They take all your gown out. They, they hold your hands and I mean, you're, you're out and they put the mask on me and gone. So uh, the, the, I remember the last thing I thought at that moment, it was my daughter. I just want to see my daughter again. So I went through the surgery. I I came back, but I was still uh, sort of sleeping. I, I was I woke up. They took out all of the all of the liquid. It turned out to be a terrible infection, and it, I was they it was really really serious. But I remember just for those doctors that are there listening, that doctors think that well the fact that my heart is beating and everything. And they think I'm still on the anesthesia. I was listening to everything. Mm. And I remember these two nurses saying, oh, poor lady. She's so sick. And she's got a beautiful little daughter. And she's never going to see her again. Wow. Oh, God, poor lady. I mean, she's just. And I was like, wait, wait a minute. I'm here. I'm alive. <laughs> I'm listening. So I didn't know where I was at that point, you know. And I, But I, I do know that I was just waking up. And nurses sometimes talk things that shouldn't be said in front of a patient mm. because I heard all the conversation. So that day, it was some hours before what, what happened next. They told my parents, you know, she's in a very serious condition. We don't think she's going to make it. She's got a very serious infection and probably one or two days, but she won't survive. We need, we need to give her antibiotics. And we only have three options. And if we miss the first one, uh, we're, we're out of time. So they told my husband, please get her papers ready because she's under the name of a, as a single woman. And you're not going to be able to take her out. It's going to be her dad. The name is important. And they, it was like, just fix everything because she's going to pass. I mean, mm -hmm. we know that. And my husband was like crazy. He started running because he he he's always liked a lot of exercise so he started going up the stairs and down the stairs my parents were going crazy so in 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 the moment that i was supposed to be taking care of by two nurses something happened again things that we think are a horrible thing to happen turn up to be the greatest blessing mm. <clears throat> that i'm going to do are here So I remember one of the nurses saying, <clears throat> you know, I'm, I'm going to go and visit my boyfriend at McDonald's down there <laughs> because he's there. And the other nurse said, OK, go fast. And I, I mean, I was intubated. I was with my hands held to the reels because otherwise you take it out. So I was just listening and with my eyes closed, but I was awake. <clears throat> and then and they knew I was awake. <clears throat> and then. They came to me, uh, one of the, the other nurse came to me and said, okay, sweetie, are you okay? And I opened my eyes and she said, I'm just gonna get a little bit of water. We're talking about 10 steps away from me. Well, whatever, I had already told them that I felt something in the tube was wrong. Mm -hmm. that I had already been intubated once. And this time I felt that I could swallow and you're not supposed to be able to swallow. And I said, and then and I just signaled it. And they said, yeah, you have a tube, but you're okay. And I was just like trying to let them know that there was something. Wow. They, they just didn't listen. <clears throat> and, you know, I understand it because when you're a doctor and when you're a nurse and they're in that situation, you don't really know when the patient is really, and now maybe they take more of this. We're talking about more than 35 years ago. Mm -hmm. So uh, things have changed a lot. So when they both left, there was a phlegm that came into the tube and got stuck. So uh, suddenly, the <clears throat> please, you need to edit this because <clears throat> I do need to. 
<clears throat> okay. So in that moment, a flame got into the tube and it stopped it. It stopped the air coming with through the machine. Remember, I was with my hands tight. I was just trying to gasp, gasping. I was trying to get the tube out. I couldn't, of course. And then suddenly I got into a, a respiratory arrest and immediately a heart arrest. And in that moment, the machine starts sounding like it usually is. Beep, beep, beep. So the nurse come in, the other nurse comes in, all the doctors come in and they start shouting, respiratory, respiratory, this is, this is an emergency. And I remember me desperately banging my legs, trying to get the air from anywhere. And there's two nurses holding my legs for me to calm down. There's a doctor on my side trying to get it. He got the top part of the tube out, trying to put some liquid to get the phlegm out. So he tried once, he tried twice, and, and I was gone. In that moment, I saw myself coming out of my body. And I saw everything they were doing to my body. You know, <clears throat> it was, I was, I saw them with electroshock, the CPR, the, and it was like a whole army around me. And I was just looking at them and I saw my body, but then I saw me and it was like, but, but I can breathe now. I was, I was free. It was, and I, you don't, I didn't understand right away that that was my body because I felt so free so complete so whole that it didn't really matter who was up there you know it was i i, I it's okay mm. so it, at that moment i understood that i was able to see 360 degrees and for me to be able to tell this story is that what you do is you you concentrate on on an area but everything is happening at the same time Everything was happening at the same time. But uh, I've always found it very hard to find words to explain my new life experience because there's really no words for a lot of things that are happening. But the only way you can is just to try to concentrate in different events. Mm -hmm. So at, at the same time, what happened is that I saw my parents uh, because remember, I was I was in a, in a situation where I was in a very serious condition. They were in the waiting room praying a rosary, things mm -hmm. that I didn't even know that were happening in that moment. They were praying a rosary. And at the same time, I saw my siblings out there. Um, <clears throat> one of them was at work. The other one was my brother was playing football. And my other sister was at home. So I knew exactly where everybody was. And then suddenly what happened to me is I was watching all of this. And then I, I, I again could see my body. And my my all of the doctors were doing, but you know it didn't matter anymore. I was just feeling living an, a very different experience, and I found myself like in a some people call it a tunnel. For me, it was like if I was inside a tree, mm -hmm. like a this cylind cylinder kind of tree, and I started seeing branches. So I started floating, and the first thing I saw was a lot of little animals rabbits, um, <clears throat> little squirrels, uh, all of this beauty, insects, everything created, but like in a, the, the little things, that the, 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 all, all of these beings that are alive, the little ones, I saw everything, and they were so harmonious. Everything was so peaceful, but, but understand me, everything is happening at the same time. So when I concentrated my attention to something else, is when is the way I can describe it. So at some point when I was floating, remember what was the last thing I wanted before my surgery was to see my daughter again. Mm. So in that moment, I turned and I saw her. And she was in a crib in my aunt Martha's house. <laughs> I had no idea somebody had taken her there. So she was playing in a crib, in a little crib, playing with her toys. And I saw her, and for in that moment, I understood what detachment means. Because mm -hmm. I said, I just asked to see her again. And you know, she's going to be okay. I don't need to have her for me to be okay and for her to be okay. So in that, in, in that moment, I understood that 
I was given, granted that wish. I saw my daughter. She's okay. She's being taken care of. All of these things I had no idea, but I was watching them from another realm. And I, I was understanding that I was, but you know, I never felt detached from who I am. So it was always me, but it was living in another experience. So that, that's the reason when I uh, came to understand that when we say my eyes, my mouth, my hair, why? Because my things are from a spiritual being that has a body. Mm. You know, it's not, we're not the body at all. We just have things like my, when you talk about your eyes, well, whose eyes? Well, mine. So who is me? So that was the person I was back then. I understood that it was my spiritual being understanding a lot of and, and seeing a lot of things. So I started floating <clears throat> in, in inside of this sort of cylinder. And then I, I call it branches. I don't know exactly uh, what they were, but for me, since... Since you tried to give a a 3D explanation, you know, to with words to what's happening, I thought it was branches, but it could have been levels, mm. you know. So I said uh, branches, but I, then I kept floating inside, and it was like they extended. I I there was no limit to this extension of what I was watching, so maybe this was another level, but there was another set of branches, and I saw. <clears throat> uh, horses, giraffes, a lot of these elephants, a lot of the animal creation beauty. And one of the panthers, I remember, a black panther, a beautiful one, looked at me straight at the eyes, and I could even touch it. Mm-hmm. In that experience, I I had an I, I changed completely my relation with everything that's alive. We are all creations. We are all one. And I understood it in that moment, my respect for animals. And that doesn't mean that because I have respect for them, I I will never eat plants or anything or animals again. It's not that because I also think that we are all part of this creation and we, we are part of this evolution that has and we need to eat. And I, every time I, I have a lunch now, me and my now husband, we, we give thanks for all the sacrifices that need to be made for us to have the food we have. Mm-hmm. Because everybody is part of, I mean, this is part of our evolution or, or of our raising awareness of growth. So I never saw it like a, like a scene because we're doing things, but I do see, I did see that healing each other without any mercy, without any, like giving thanks to the animal that's going to feed you, giving, being grateful for the plants that you're going to, all the food and everything we take. There's where I understood why my parents always, always, every meal we gave thanks for our food. Mm -hmm. And it now makes sense. Now that's where we're grateful because all of these things that are so beautifully alive have to die for me to continue living because I have to eat something. Everything started making sense, but in a very beautiful, spiritual way. Mm. So I was just being so respectful about plants, about animals, about every single part of the creation. My respect for everything changed. So I kept on floating. And then suddenly I saw another, uh, a lot of uh, level of branches. And then I saw the little children, children running, coming. I saw waterfalls music it was a beautiful scenery you can't imagine a more the the beauty of just being there surrounded by this creation all of the and the peace i felt the beautiful peace everything around me was peaceful was harmony and there was no no moment in which i was regretting anything because i could still if i if I set my attention on my body, I could still see that they were walking, working on the body, but it was the body it was not me. Mm. It was it was I was here. I was alive. I was more alive than ever in my in my whole uh, conscious mind. 
So I kept floating on us and I saw a lot of um, uh, people our age and there were just a lot of adults there. And the, the interesting thing is that in that, in those, in that experience, I recall seeing small groups, like if there were a, a, a master teaching people there, they were like in little groups. Wow. And I saw all of that, like something marvelous that I now understand that, that well, there's, there's a lot going on in the other realm. There's a lot of teachings. There's a lot of understanding. And I was, and I was being greeted. Look, I thought I knew nobody, but suddenly everybody was like family. <laughs> everybody turn turn around and i was greeted by you didn't need to talk but i understood everything that everybody was saying and he was welcoming me with a beautiful smile a beautiful okay you're you're back here but he was like if i was just understanding what was going on i kept on floating and then i saw another level of branches with elderly people all of them were um were uh, I, I wouldn't say old people like like uh, but I knew there was it, it must be in the level of awareness they were wise people mm -hmm. I could see that they were a lot of wisdom and then I remember them looking at me giving me a welcome but they were they were also gathered in groups like if they were different kind of groups and and uh, there was a lot of garden a lot of uh, I saw beautiful forest, everything around. I have some pictures that I'm going to show you so you can, because I did this with AI. This where AI oh. really works. Wow. And, and it, it, it's amazing the result that came out of it. So I will share this with you so you can share it with your audience if you want, because it is incredible everything that was happening at the same time. So I kept on, and then suddenly I turned out and I see a little circle. It was a, a dull yellow. And the only thing I wanted is to get in there. So when I started, because I was floating, I couldn't control that. I was just floating, looking at all this. Uh, I would describe it the most loving experience I've ever had in my life. Because everything I could feel from these people through their looks, through their smile, was the love, the way they received me. So when I got into this little circle, I got like stuck and just imagine you're trying to open a door and there's a lot of air outside. When I opened it, it was, <gasps> I just oh. felt full, full of it. All of my body was like uh, embraced with this light. Mm. I was filled in with it. I couldn't see anything, but I felt, I've never in my life felt so much love. It was like an ecstasy of love in that moment. And I felt a little hand, a hand on my head. I still remember the words and, and some words of, a, of a, a voice telling me, stay calm and go with peace. It's not your time. Do everything I've told you. And I was like, wait, wait, wait a minute, what? what? <laughs> and I started going through all of these branches again, all these levels. And I feel the sensation of coming back to my body. And it starts hurting again. Mm -hmm. All that relief that I had. And then I hear, and all this is true the way what people say about this. I hear these voices, she's back. We got her back. <laughs> and my heart, beep, 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 beep. And then I, I, I feel the, the, the warmth of the, the uh, extra, I mean, of the, how do you call them? The CPR, oh. they're doing it on me. And, and since there were several minutes that I was gone, without oxygen in my head, my body, I started going like round and round and round. And I was, I was so dizzy. And I was, what do you think about the first sensation I had? It was like, I was so angry at these doctors that they were so, how can they be so selfish? <laughs> I was finally asleep. I thought I was sleeping and they want to wake me up. Mm. So they start shouting, we're losing her, we're losing her. Because this was a, this was something that took quite a while. Later on, when I did all the investigation for my book, it took them around an hour to keep, to bring me back to be stable. Mm. 
Wow. Because I was, they lost me and brought me back several times during this hour. So, but in my mind, I was like, why are they so selfish? I just want to go back to where I was. Don't you understand? I was just about to understand where I was. I mean, it was, I want to go back to that place. I want, so my, my inner sensation was just let me go. Please let me go. I don't, everything is perfect there. Why should I, why do I have to be here? So it took me a while, Omar, to understand that I was dying. Mm. That I was, my body was dying. So uh, they they tried a, several times until there was a moment in which I, I just came at peace and I said, okay, just sit still, breathe and try to understand. So I had a little booklet in my in my by my side that they gave to me so I could write questions or things because remember I was intubated. So I was asking them, where was I? I asked them like if they knew, but I didn't, I, I was just trying to understand. And they said, okay, you're in the you're in the hospital, you're okay. There was a little problem with your tube, but we solved it. <laughs> so there was a little problem with my tail. <laughs> and you know, was that was that really a problem or was that the biggest blessing? Mm. So there's where we need to understand that sometimes accidents, horrible things that happen to us, sometimes come to us because that's the only way that could lead you to the next step. Mm. So anything that happens to us, anything, has another purpose. There's not uh, uh, even what we call horrible tragedies. There's always a learning process through them. Because let me tell you something. When we go to the other realm, the last thing you're going to remember is how much you suffered. You think I remembered how I was gasping and how I was... No, I mean, that was the last thing you're going to... You're not, When you leave this body, that, that was just like a little step to get to the real thing. So yes, in this human realm, we do think, and we always say like, oh, poor lady, she suffered a lot. Well, stop pouring her. She's just she's just in the best position. But, And that's the last thing they, they bring with them. Don't, nobody brings with them all, all of those sufferings that we think they took with them. That's mm -hmm. not what we take. That's only like a moment for you to go to the next step. So um, I think that one of the one of the biggest blessings I had with that with that experience was to understand that definitely there is another realm, there is another life, there is another another uh, reason for us to be here, and that each one of us has an amazing purpose in life. I was after that I was in the hospital. It's still for about three more weeks, and I had a lot of a lot of beautiful experiences where I saw angels coming to me several times. Mm -hmm. A lot of beautiful things going on, but I do I do think that that uh, after that experience that that was the biggest one because I did I did have two angels coming and clean me up and. Three days after that, I was out of the hospital. But I understand that our thinking, what we think about things, changed the whole. It's not really what happens to you, but how you react to what happens to you that's going to make a difference. How are you going to react after all this? I knew that that apparently terrible thing had been one of the greatest blessings in my life. And nowadays, I can tell you, Omar, that I have been very blessed with my heart. My heart has been one of the biggest gifts that I've ever gotten. It was probably born to die very, very early on. It's still alive. I've had two open heart surgeries. I've, heard, mm -hmm. I've had several ablations. I've gone through a lot in the body. Mm -hmm. But what I really like to share is what it's what has happened in the spirit. And in my spirit, I have grown so much the way I see life, the way I I I know one day I'm gonna leave this world. I mean, we all have to go. 
But I want, whenever, whenever death finds me, I want it to find me very alive. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So how can death find you alive? Well, doing exactly what you're meant to do. And how do I know what I was meant to do? What comes natural? It's what you're meant to do. Don't force yourself to find a purpose that's not natural in you. Trying to do something that just because I want to be famous, but it's not natural in me to be acting, sort of. Or it's not natural for me to do this. Well, then find what's natural in you. Something that brings that inner joy in your heart. If it's helping people, if it's talking, if it's cooking, if it's creating, being a builder, something that's so natural in you that brings joy. Mm. That's part of your purpose. Don't break your head trying to find this humongous uh, to impact the whole world. Sometimes we just come to bring joy to a few or to uh, through a little through little things that are going to be majestic in ways you don't even imagine. Mm. So that would be my my big message. <laughs> <laughs> no, and it's a beautiful message. Um, Thank you. I know in your bio, it said, you know, it's funny because it, as you were speaking, there was so many things that I wanted to ask you questions about, but you answered them anyway. So, so, but, but after, um, I know in the bio, it says about how you've been given at least over a hundred messages that it's, they asked you to bring from the other side to hear like, what's one of those. After, after my years of experience. Mm -hmm. And this is a whole other talk. We can talk about it, but uh, there was a lot of, of abilities I, I started developing. Mm. One of them was dreams. Through my dreams, I started getting a lot, a lot of messages. I started communicating with people that are not here, that, get, that gave messages and uh, that are not in this realm. And a lot of visualizations of things that, that could happen. I started developing the psych, this psychic sort of, I mean, I, everything has a name. I did a lot of things without knowing that there were names for everything, but I started <clears throat> bringing different messages. And that then they, they, at the beginning, <clears throat> when this started to happen at the beginning, I was very afraid to share it because mm. I thought it was just my crazy mind. But when I started sharing them, they had a lot of sense. So then nowadays, I'm not afraid of sharing any of my dreams. And I have hundreds of them i have a lot of them written down because they had a meaning to the people that i shared them with that i have i have uh, had messages for people about their wheels about um uh, like uh somebody that that feels that i'm i'm very upset because because i know my friend died and i never went to visit and i had a i didn't know these things and i get messages about tell them that i'm okay that i'm doing this and this and that and then I found out that that was one of the biggest dreams of that person. So I've had messages of people, uh, information that I had no way to know that I get it to my dreams. And then I start sharing them and they make a lot of sense. So I've under, I've, I've come to understand, to respect that, you know, and this is something for you to take with you. We all have gifts. All of us have gifts, but sometimes we are, too afraid to talk about them and to develop them because we're thinking what are they going to think about me mm. they're going to say i'm crazy and if i share this they're going to say forget about what they're going to say forget about what others are going to think there's somebody out there that needs to listen to what your come your gift is about and if your gift is probably creating music probably creating being a, a, an amazing writer probably creating a, I don't know, there's there's a lot of things that must be in your mind, but you're afraid because what if? Remember that what if changed my life? What if God has another plan? Mm. And what if that is supposed to be done by you? What if that dream that you've had constantly in your mind is true, but you just need to believe it? Mm. You know, I don't think that there's anything in our mind that comes to our mind 
If we can dream it, we can create it. But what is the factor there? You have to believe it. Mm. And believing in, in that we all come with a, with a certain gifts that we need to develop, believing it is going to change the whole picture. So I believe that one of the biggest purposes for me coming back was this gift that I was giving to, to uh, understand that there was a lot of, I have a lot of channeling right now. Mm. I, I can start giving a talk and suddenly I just feel it and it flows. And people say, what, well, how did you know about that? Well, I didn't. I just started channeling it. So I started opening my spiritual uh, soul, my being, to understand that we can all communicate. It's just letting it flow. That's why I recommend a lot of whatever way, because there's a lot of uh, ways to meditate. But meditation is a way to connect. And there's many ways you can meditate. But why? Why is it so important? Because there's a lot of wisdom in you that you're not listening to. Don't expect that the wisdom is always going to come out from the outside. It's within you. But if we don't listen to ourselves, getting ourselves in a position of, of, a, of, of knowing that we're spiritual beings with a lot of wisdom and we come with this knowledge, you're just going to feel that everything has to come from outside. But how do you start with all of this? Well, start listening to the people you like. Start listening to people that do that do uh, uh, these meditations, maybe YouTube videos or read books. Keep yourself in a cycle of, of learning. And then wait for the moment to say, okay, now what? That's the way I talk to myself, Anna Cecilia. What is it? that you need to tell me. And I listen. And I've been doing this since I was a little girl because when I had no air to breathe, I went to my bed and I was just like, okay, oxygen. You need to go in. And I talk to my body. You need to go in, go to the lungs, and then oxygenate my body because I need to turn pink again to go out to play. I didn't even know I was doing that. Wow. I was, I had these abilities of doing it since I was a little girl, convincing my body to be strong so I could go out and play. Mm. So how many things do you have to say yourself that you're not doing it? So listen to your wisdom, listen to your inner voice, raise your awareness. And one of the biggest things I can tell you is watch out to what you're listening to. Mm -hmm. so all of that information comes in you and you are creating through that information. So just be like, be aware of what, anything that comes in is part of what you are letting it build inside you. So what are, who are you listening to? When you're in, under a lot of stress, the last persons you need to hear is more stressed persons because they're just going to bring more stress to your life. So when you're going under, under a lot of stress, and there are a lot of doubts. Listen to people that can bring you hope, that can bring you peace, that can bring you love, that can bring you harmony. And then you can go back to those people later. But you need to choose your battles. And when you are when you are like a soldier that's there in the floor, just down, what you need is to go to the nursery room to heal. Yeah. And then you can go back and fight. But for now, you need to understand that you cannot always be in the field. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you need the peace to heal and then be strong again to go out and do whatever you need to do. But listen to your inner wisdom. And sometimes it's this hospital sort of or this nursing places are where you're going to get the peace to listen to your wisdom. We are all in this realm, in this world, for a purpose, yes, we are. But don't break your head trying to find like the most difficult things in the world for you. What comes easy? And the best way to find it is in these peaceful places, these nursing places. And you can find those places through meditation. Mm -hmm. Try to hear the people that are wise. Try to get together with people that, that build in you and not take away from you. The energy that, 
that things that take a lot of energy out of you. Try to stay away from those things so you can really feel strong to make your own decisions because the rest just weakens you. Absolutely. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. No, no. Anything else? Because <laughs> I don't want to feel in this space and we've been here for a while. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, no, yeah, we're, we're in there right now. But I wanted to ask you about that because that comes up a lot for me. Like you said, um, try not to be around those that, you know, kind of put a put you in a negative space. But do you feel... Is that part of their contract? Is there part of, part of their contract to bring you that negativity so you can grow and make the right decisions? Are, are they ever aware of that? Or it's all... It's, you, it don't gets need to worry. you don't need to worry if they're aware of that or not. But you know it. Yeah, yeah. Whatever they're aware of is their purpose in life. Mm. You need to know that people in your life that make your life difficult, sort of saying, have a purpose in your life. So once you're able, look at this, listen to this more. Once we are able to say, thank you. I understood your purpose in my life, but I'm ready to move on. But thank you. Move on. <laughs> but once you're ready to do that, then you won't be attached to that person. But whenever you're ready to say thank you because of everything I learned, because you, you gave me the opportunity to see what I don't want. Mm. You gave me the opportunity. Then forget about gossiping about them or, or uh, cursing them. No, don't lose time with that. Just be, be grateful with them mm. because you now know what you don't want. So just... Send them love, send them light, but get away because you learned what you had to learn. Staying there means you're not ready yet. Mm. That's why we're still there. So if you keep uh, getting together with, well, I always meet this horrible amount of people. Well, then you're not ready to move on. You're still mm. there because you still have something to work on. Mm. If, you're, if you keep yourself in the middle of a problem, it's because you're not ready to get rid of it. When you're ready to get rid of the problem is when you say, thank you, problem. I learned what I had to learn, but you can leave now. Mm. But sometimes we are the ones that are not ready mm. because you still haven't learned what you need to learn. Mm. Interesting. You know, it's funny because, you know, like how you mentioned a lot, like from, because I do that a lot, right? From when I was growing up to now, things change so much, right? And it's funny that now, like even that, we have things like block, right? Like if someone, you could just block their number, block them on social media, block. <laughs> so we live in a time where it, it is very accessible to remove someone from your life if you want them, if you want to do that. But so. you know, you can remove them physically, but have you removed them emotionally? Yeah, yeah. That's it. Because what I do with people that are difficult uh, that I we all have those people around us that, and some some of them are family, and you cannot always just like block them. <laughs> so what I do every night is just cover them with a beam of light. Mm -hmm. Cover them, cover myself, and send them the best. And I've always said, just everything that comes to me that's gonna look at me with love, with harmony, with blessing, let them see me. Otherwise, let me be invisible. Mm. So I am invisible to those things that are not going to bring love, harmony, and, and that are not going to be for my growth. And if something that's negative finds me, it's because maybe I need something to learn about it. So you just start looking at life in a way that it's nothing. It's an accident. And when we bring it, because we need to learn. And yeah, you can block a lot of people out of your life in, in social media, but are you really blocking them for what they mean to you? What you need to, to really block is what it's the meaning of those people in you. Mm -hmm. It's the thought of what that, just, just having the thought of what that person means is more harmful than that person itself. Mm -hmm. You know, so what we need to 
to heal is that thought. That thought about that that's really harming me. Okay, if somebody that has been abusing you. Okay, just the thought of the person abusing you is horrible. So just get out of that person abusing you, but try to heal and cover that person apart from them from your life. But just try to see that that person was there for a purpose. Thank them. It's very difficult to thank someone, someone that abused you, but you learned. You learned something. So thank you for all I learned, but I don't need you anymore. And thank you. Because when we really are in the, in the awareness to understand that it is a learning process we're going through, and that you are, you're mature enough to say thank you for what you did. I learned. But you know, you can go someplace else to do this. And I wish you the best. But never cursing people. Because that, that, that's just creating something in you, not in them. They don't even know you're cursing them. So just, that's what I tell you. I just protect them with this beam of light. Put them apart. But every night, as long as something is going on, just imagine that you're putting them inside a white balloon of light. Just put them in there, hold them in there with, with love, not with hate, because that's something not, not good for you. And just do that and go to the next person. But do an exercise in your mind that you're not ignoring them because they exist, but you're just covering them with. And you know, I did this for probably two or three years and it worked marvelously. Mm -hmm. Now I have an amazing relation with this person. We we and it was very difficult for some at some time, and he, he was not somebody I could just turn take out of my life. Mm -hmm. But yes, I think that people are there. It's part of their contract, and that's why you need to attack them. Well, thank you. You did a very good job because it really took me a lot to get to learn this because I I, I don't want to hate you, but you really were very close for me to do it. You know. So just thank them and don't take that hatred with you because the only one that's harming is yourself, not them. But yes, uh, when, when Jesus Christ said, love one another like I've loved you, love your enemies like I loved you. He, he didn't mean like, like love them to hug them and have them in your life forever. That is loving someone, it's understanding that they had a purpose in your life mm. and that you're able to thank them, put them there. Loving someone is respecting their purpose in life and just thank you. I don't need you anymore with me. I You served your purpose, but just make sure that they really served it. Because if you're constantly thinking about all the harm they did, whether well, you're not done yet. If it's something that is still in your mind, well, you're not ready to let them go. When are you ready to let them go? When you can think about them and just being grateful for their lives and, and that's it. Would you return to them? No, I wouldn't because I learned my lesson and that was their purpose and that was mine. Omar, I, I think we need to be wrapping up because I have some a colleague call in a moment. Oh, no, absolutely. Thank we, you. We can, we can meet again whenever you want. Absolutely. No, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's been an honor. Just real quick, do you want to tell everyone where they can find your book and and if your yes, website? Yes, thank and you everything? very much. I yeah. my book is when life is not forever. You can find it in Amazon, mm -hmm. and I, I also have a web page which is my name, anaceciliagonzalez.com, and I my Facebook is with my name too, and my Twitter and Instagram is anaceci c a n a c e c y gcc like my last name gonzalez at gmail i mean at uh, gmail.com that's my address in case you want to write but it's uh, my twitter and my instagram okay perfect and i'll put all the links uh, below you. but no thank, thank you thank so you much. for having me here Absolutely. thank you for this beautiful gift of sharing and i wish you all the best and i i'm just telling you if i could give a last message just listen to your inner voice there's a lot of wisdom inside you listen and thank, thank you for giving me the chance thank you so much it's been an honor I'm grateful thank you thank you 
Life may move fast, though it may move slow I made a silly man who said he'd make it so We look about towards space, so even at the sky One day pass away, but never look inside Breathe in, breathe out Life is a man's move, bigger than sound I mean you Wait forever, forever.